sorry, not a latte, it's a uh, medium skinny caramel macchiato. Did you still want the sugar free one? Yes, please. And it was with an extra shot? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I had a phone call from Dan and he's ahead of schedule on the landscaping. So he's ripped out the front. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And the reason he's got ahead of it is for that reason right there, H. Point the camera. The road is closed up right in front of the property. So he said it's a perfect time to get the excavator into the road and rip out the front. Let's go and have a look at what he's been up to. Well, okay. There's a big pile of rubble and I'm assuming that's not from us. There was not that much stuff around the front of the house. It is us. It's all out. The whole front of the property has been ripped out. He's done that in a day. I guess one thing I'm curious of right now, H, is it's clear that they're doing some works around this manhole here, but all this rubble must be ours. I wonder who's gonna take that away. That's surely our responsibility, but it looks like also the council, whoever's doing the roadworks, has ripped some stuff up too. So this is council here, yeah? Yeah, this is the council that's doing this. This is why the road is closed. I'm assuming, by the way, I didn't know the road was being closed until Dan let me know in a voice message and basically just said, road is closed. It's an ideal time to swing an excavator out and rip out the front. So that's what he's done. And he's done a really good, clean, tidy job. I'm pretty sure, H, we are first on site. Mate, you do sound like death. Hey, not a problem. Get rested up. Yeah, see you tomorrow. So here's the update. A little bit frustrating, if I'm being honest, but it turns out trades professionals are humans too. Dan is ill, and apparently he shouldn't have even been on site yesterday with how ill he was feeling. But because of that road closure, he's decided to crack on, rip out the front, done an amazing job, but he's not on site today. So what I thought I'd do, use this opportunity to talk through what's happening for the rest of this episode. So Dan will be feeling better tomorrow. I'm expecting a quick, speedy recovery. He'll be on site to go through, firstly, the plans for the landscaping, We've got Nick Bundy, who I also just spoke to, who's done an amazing amount of work within the property, pulling cables, so we're gonna see exactly what's going on inside. And we've got Chris, our plumbing and heating engineer, who's got a whole roll of copper arriving tomorrow to get that first fix in place. And I'm looking forward to seeing that Baxi heating system, which has got the combi boiler, the heat only boiler, and the mega flow cylinder going in. I'm gonna show you guys exactly what's included of getting a new heating system in your property. So it turns out Danny is feeling much better today. Personally, I feel like you just had the day off to get a fresh new haircut, but that's beside the point. What do you think? You look good. Let's Cheers. talk about the front of the house, because I think previously when we shot this, when you weren't on site, we thought that was muck that you've pulled out. No. That's not our muck. Do you want to talk through what the council's done at the front of the property? So this is all part of the 7 Trent Network. What they're about to do is they've changed the size of the pipe that goes into the manhole and going back out. There's a backup, basically. They've um, changed the size of the pipe. But as you can see, uh, there's a lot of muck that came out. Yeah, and road's been closed. Road's been closed, which was great for us though, because whilst it was closed, we took advantage of doing the front. That's what I said, we actually got some content on the way in saying you'd actually got ahead of schedule. Before we talk about what you did at the front, can I just say that I'm not happy? This looks terrible. Yeah, so... I'm not criticising Seven Trent, but I'm criticising Seven Trent because this looks dog, if I'm being honest with you. The, the way the manhole's uh, positioned often um, is accounted by the way the flow goes. So the pipe be coming in and going back out. Yep. So you have your manhole square as, because if someone's got to get in there and do any maintenance work, they need to have it square onto the hole. So that's that I can understand. But they cut out the tarmac. People say I'm OCD, I'm not but I do like things nice and square. This would be a straight line. You know, it's been dog legged two or three times. They put some banding around to try and hide it, but it goes around in a very, very strange shape. And also when it comes to quantifying materials as demonstrated, cameraman to your left, okay, they've not been able to work out properly. The, Someone's uh, got to come back and finish that. Yeah, so it's another patch. Imagine paying a day rate on that. Not happy with this but it is what it is. It kind of feels like what they've had to do is close the road off, get this done quickly. Could have been done a bit neater and quicker. Yeah. But let's talk about what we've done at the front of the property. Let's stop moaning about this. Whilst the road was closed, uh, there's only a pedestrian access down that side at that point, so no vehicles coming through. We thought, right, great time to get in with the digger and start stripping back. So, as you remember, if you look back at previous images, you'll see there's Derbyshire stone all the way around, but it's quite low. So what we've done is taken them all back out, we've stacked them around the corner for the time being. It's gonna reuse that material. We've basically scraped off all the greenery. Uh, there's still bits we've got to peel off from the front of the house. We've basically reduced the level down to road level. Uh, the reason for this is that we are going to build it back up, but we're going to put some Derbyshire stone back in at a higher level. And then the manholes, we're going to put some recessed lids in. What we're going to do at the front is we're going to have some nice dressing stone. 
with a couple of nice plants. So there's still going to be the greenery, but it's not going to be flooded with greenery. It's it will be based on the budget you put in. The amount of money that I've seen for plants on this whole property is mind blowing, by the way. My drawings were great. He kept saying to me, you draw another plant on there, you pay for yourself. <laughs> Once we've done that, we've got the Derbyshire stone border. We're also going to do some down towards the entrances of the house, the four bed and the cottage. And we're going to use again the Derbyshire stone to keep that within field of the property in the local area. We're going to have to do some repointing of the front. There used to be a nice canopy on here, so we're going to have to do some pointing up, make good. Yep. Uh, get rid of the lead work, repoint it around the front there. So once you've done this, actually before we talk about this, if that's not our muck, where is our muck? Right, our muck is around this corner. The muck that we dug out has gone into the, uh, the corner there. So it's, it's just soil. So when we build a retaining wall in the back garden, which we'll talk about in a minute, we can then use that as backfill. So, so you, haven't, you haven't had to pay to get that muck away done. You can put that into the back garden. Yeah. Jobs are good. In. Save a few quid where we can. And last thing, I guess, on the front of the property is once you've done that, that'll look stunning. I was really happy when I saw this. It looks dead clean. One of these windows and doors are in. This is going to look stunning when it's all done. It is. It's going to look lovely. We're just going to get a couple of brackets down, a bit of timber off the wall. Like I say, get rid of the lead work, do some points up, get rid of old cables. A <laughs> couple, 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 <laughs> little bits. It's half a day's work at a push. A couple of plants and hanging baskets, I'm yeah. sure, will end up in the budget at some point in this guy. Good shout. Good shout. <laughs> Go on, let's have a look around the back garden. Here's the muck away, but I guess one thing we haven't covered off right now is what we're we actually doing in the back of the garden because we've changed our ideas a few times and there's been some considerations. Yeah. Do you want to talk through what we're actually going to end up doing now? Because we're, we're fixed. Yeah, so we'll start off with the driveway. So obviously we're going to peel this up, um, tart one base, and then we'll put some dressing stone. That's going to lead around the corner to this extension on the back of the four bed. This level's going to be retained to the same level across here. So there's a bit of an infilter done here. Yep. And then we're going to have a bit of a retainer, which is going to be made out of sleepers. So there's going to be parking here, but there's also going to be um, a few slabs here um, for access, a bit of a walkway. Yep. So on top of the sleepers, you're going to have the post and rail fencing. So that basically shows a bit of a demarcation. Yep. At the face of the sleepers, we're going to have a, a gravel strip. That acts a bit of a soak away as well. So any moisture that comes off that, we'll soak away into the gravel strip. We'll have a soak away that runs all the way down to the brook. It's Perfect. all surface water, so it should be no harm. Rear access for the cottage, we'd originally spoke about putting together this shared access, which if I just jog over here, we were thinking about putting some steps, nearly went over there, by the way, twice. We are thinking about putting some steps up here, down this wall, along the back, so the person that owns the cottage has rear access. What's the thinking now? For me, I didn't believe that to be practical. The reason I say that is if you bought the four bed, you want your garden, nice views. The last thing you want is people walking around the back of your garden, interrupting your, your kids or family members coming around, just enjoying the garden. Yeah. And you want to enjoy the view as well, because if you did put that uh, pathway around the back, you need fencing to segregate. Yep. So all of a sudden, you haven't just got the boundary fencing because you have to put that in place with a walkway. You'd have the internal fencing as well. So one, you've got cost and two, practicality, it isn't there. It just uh, made sense to keep it as easy going as possible, keep the garden segregated. What's theirs is theirs. What's the cottages is the cottages. So that's what we're not doing. What are we doing? Because you can see where Harry is behind the camera right now. He's, what's that, four foot above us? Yeah. So what's happening here? What we're going to do is um, obviously we're going to build this ground level up anyway, so that's going to feel less. But we're going to have a retaining wall all the way through. There are going to be a couple of gaps in it. So, excuse the noise of the machine. Opposite the doorway to the four bed, we'll have uh, an opening in the wall, which will come up and it'll probably be about three or four foot, maybe four foot wide. Then it'll open up as like a sweep and it'll look like bell mouth a little bit. And then we'll just batter the banks back and put some plants around the edge of it. Yep. So it's like a nice grand entrance to a lovely garden. Um, and look at the view you've got behind you. I mean, you imagine sitting up here in the sun, imagine this all grass. Yep. You've got your fences across there, separating the gardens, two separate levels. You can sit out on top, look at the fields over there, put a glass of wine on your patio. So a nice sweep up here, porcelain paving around the back of the property. Yep, down the side of this four bed here where the extension is, where that pile of bricks is, perfect area for a bin tidy. But it also then means the cottage with the parking on my right hand side, close to the wall, can have an area here. It could be an enclosed bin tidy. Won't look too much of an eyesore off the side of the road. You know, they can park plenty of cars down this side. Before we wrap up, just keep walking. Before we wrap up on the garden, we're at the back of the cottage here. This is very exposed to the brook. What are we doing with that wall and extending it? or just at least putting some form of a boundary so this is a bit more of a safer space for a family. We're going to use the same principle with the footing and the, re and the retaining wall, but in this case it's going to be lower level. So again, I don't want to take the look off the brook, someone moves in here, they've got an arch brook that can sit there in the summer, 
glass of wine, whatever. Glass of wine, we should be building a bridge because next door is a pub. Imagine having a nice little bridge across there to the back garden of the pub. That would be dangerous. Be your dream. <laughs> a low retaining wall, probably coming up to the top of my boot. Um, maybe a bit lower, actually. Depends on the, uh, the finish level of the porcelain. We just want to bring it just above it. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do then, we'll have some bolt down system for the post, like we're going to have on top of the sleepers. Some post and rail system. Okay. So at least then it closes it off, but doesn't close it fully. Still got the view, but it's made safe. Yeah. At I least mean, it's obvious that there's a boundary there. If, if the customer has got pets, they can change the style of the fencing. So you just take the post and rail, uh, take the rails off and put paneling on there. And it could be low level still, so you can still see over. Get a nice easy enclosure. Yeah. Perfect. Nice one. All right, let's get on with it. In the cottage, thinking about where the boilers are going. Yes. Where's your head at? My head originally was in the loft, but I poked my head up there and there's no room up there for anything. Okay. Height wise is too low to get clearance around the boiler. One to run part work, two for maintenance. Okay. So it's it's kind of a no, no go there. Yeah. Okay. The second option is probably back in here somewhere. And this is going to become a downstairs WC anyway. Yes. Depending on how, how we configure it, toilet, basin, boiler tucked away in this corner. Because so other other than that, there's not. You don't really want to stick it in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the bathroom to go. You can't build a cupboard around it. Kitchens tight. Yeah. The only thing I'm thinking is, would it go there? That feels potentially like the least offensive place to put it. You wouldn't go, you can't run the flue out the back. You can run it up. We've got vertical flue, so we're going up anyway. We've got a vertical flue. Okay. So yes, it potentially. Sparkles put a... So it sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> put a few switch, or putting a few switches there. So potentially we could go, whether that's to run outside light, whether it's run boiler, I'm not sure. Yep. But it could. It sounds like you're claiming it. We'll have it, that's Okay. So it could go there, flew out the roof, pipe work can be round either round and up because we're going through there to the property. Yeah. So yeah, we can, we can run the pipe work round. So yeah, boiler can sit, sit just there. Yeah, I think that'd be my preference because then boiler sitting there, easy access. They could potentially put some storage or something in here and then you're going to have... Whether it's basin, toilet, toilet, basin. Yeah, doesn't matter there. Really, tucked away. It? So yeah, on that as well, we've got to think of getting the Saniflow out or macerator. Yep. So we've got to make allowances for pipe work from that to go to the main stack. What is in that's going to come off the wall, basically? It'll sit behind the toilet. Yeah. So yeah, you, yeah. you've got the you've got the rocker frame going in, so it'll probably sit, probably a slimline version to sit in that. Yeah. And then pipe work will come off, shoot through the house. Would you explain what a macerator is? <laughs> Professionally or? <laughs> yeah. All so right. so a macerator is. A waste disposal poo muncher kind of unit which sits behind the toilet uh, when you've got limited access to drains. So in this scenario, our drain is all the way around the far side of the property. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get enough fall on our pipe underground to run back to that chamber from this location. Yep. So we're sticking a macerator in which as you flush the toilet will churn everything up and it pumps it out up and across to a drain point that we choose. There, there are universal ones which you can go down and across or, or horizontal, but they have a max height and a max length. Okay. So then they might push up five meters and across 10 meters. So that's something we have to take into account when we're- And that gets pushed into the soil stack somewhere? Yes. Okay. I'd say, I think my preference is, I'm thinking about, so that's obviously gonna have a door on it because it's a downstairs WC. Which way is the door going? Are you having a solid door? Are you having bifold? It's gotta go that way. Full so pool. you'd be on the internal skin. That problem? No, there's no, no, it's not a problem. It's got the clearance for a toilet. Yeah. So what, what's going on in Chris's head right now? He's trying to work out if he was sat in the toilet. Has, is, the, is he going to get clipped by a door? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the nose is getting it knocked off. So yeah, if you, if you went full full door, or you went bifold, it kind of oh okay concaves in on itself. Okay. Yeah, it's got to go that way. Well, I guess that's a us problem to work out with the door. But yeah, if we go boiler here, it's not right high. Boiler there. So there's plenty of room there to stick it. Plenty of clearance either side. Height and below it, plenty of clearance. Flue can go straight out. Yep. That's not going to cause an issue if you sat out on the back. Yep. Come up somewhere around that area. Yep which is clearance from the windows. Are they all going to be opening? Yes, I do. There was some question around here as to... Fire eggs. Yeah, I believe that one is being converted to that style because I don't think there's enough... Opening to get people out. Opening to get people out. 
but they are opening. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. There's plenty of room from the flue to the openable windows, so we've not got gases going back into the property. The flue oh, so will... your point is if that vertical flue is actually coming up further up the ceiling, obviously it's not with how this is situated, but if that was coming up further up, you could have gases coming out the flue into an open window back into the property? Yes. Okay, that's a consideration. Didn't think about that. Makes sense when you say it out loud though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> cool, let's have a look at the house. Okay, in the house, Chris, where are we putting the boiler? The old boiler used to be here. Just there, yeah. Options were up there. I like that option. Still, still an option. Yep. We've got some key light loft ladders, so they will sit nicely in that hole to allow access for maintenance, removal, install, everything like that. And would that just be the boiler, or would you get a boiler cylinder in there? Height-wise. Height-wise, yeah. it would probably fit. What's your reservation? What's going through your head at the moment? Reservation is your hot water supply. OK. So because this is furthest away from the kitchen, mm -hmm. we'd probably have to run a secondary return, which is you have a pump on your hot supply yep. going back, so you've got a constant circuit. So you're getting, so you've not got a lead time to get hot water, hot water to the kitchen sink. Okay. So and if it gone, didn't go there, so it, it sounds like boiler's well, a good option there. We've got the key light loft ladders to go in. Where else would the cylinder go? Probably in that first bedroom. But yeah, either the boiler up there. We've then got to make allowances for frost protection because it's not the warmest up there. Or depending on the layout in here, because it is going to be utility, you're going to have your washer, you're going to have your dryer, fridge, freezer. Ease of access, ease of maintenance. Yeah, that's one of my considerations at the moment. Just thinking about this. If I'm a homeowner, well, so I, if, if, <laughs> I am a homeowner <laughs> and I would like access to my boiler, you know, just. Something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, it's easier to go and check it or speak to an engineer and say, my boiler pressure's down, and then you can talk me through it on the phone. I'm not saying that happens often, but. It is a consideration. Could go in here, it's just that window, isn't it? Why is that a problem? Um, getting the flue out. It's openable. I'm not sure of how deep you need the boiler, but could it sit, see where these shelves are in that corner on that wall? Because I believe if you cord out the back of that, you could get the flue through. Yeah, that's on the gable. It might work. I'm unsure of the depth of the boiler itself. But yeah, that, that might work going outside. What's above that? That's house, isn't it? So there's no, no pitch on that roof. So yeah, we'd have to go horizontal out the side of the wall. Yeah. But that's, that's yeah, again, that's that's doable. This is where you're looking for the cylinder to go in. Yeah. Which I'm assuming there was something in there before. By the looks of it, there would have been, where the big holes are in the walls, that probably would have been timbers and a tank sat on the top of them. Okay. Um, and then a cylinder low level. But that was for the old open vented system. And because we're potentially looking at using this space as storage from this room, we could put the mega flow cylinder in here, box it off, but keep access, and that's still to regs. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. That feels like the best option. Should we commit to that? Let's commit. Done. So what's your plan today, mate? Plan today is copper's coming this afternoon, mm -hmm. or a lot of parts coming this afternoon. We're going to start running the cold main from, which will be down in the utility room, firstly up to the cylinder, and then we've got to shoot it over to the kitchen, because the kitchen should be an un uninterrupted supply of cold water. Every kitchen sink, should have water straight off cold mains. So then you know, as a standard, you can go to that sink and you've got fresh water. Older properties, places like this who had tanks in the loft, they could have had low pressure mains. So it's kind of wall cold main will go to the tank. Yep. Fill the tank up, you open your basin tap upstairs, you've got low pressure water because it's coming out of that tank. It's not fresh. So yeah, we've got to get a cold main up to the cylinder and then over to the kitchen. Start marking out where pipes are going for radiators. Things we've got to take into consideration is you've got lintels above windows normally. Yep. So you can't go too close to the window. And also, if they're having curtained blinds or anything like that, how wide are they going to be around the window? Because if you put a curtain fixed in there, then my pipe works fairly close straight through it. So it's, it's little things that we've got to look at, mark out where they go in, what's access upstairs like, how's the spark is taking the boards up for me. He was actually very polite in terms of saying, oh no, you've actually done some of your own work. Do <laughs> <laughs> you appreciate it? I didn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, yeah run, run some chasers down, mark out where we're going to put the rads because we've measured all them, worked all out. Yep. Where they're going, how big they are. Um, and then yeah, just, just crack on. Next stage is we're, we're going to chop out. We've got a load of clips from Talon, yep. which we can use to run all our first fixes under the floors, clip it down the wall. So the first fix, in our case, we'll have two pipes sticking out the wall, ready for the plaster to come in, and mm -hmm. then we can hang the rads once it's a, once it's a finished wall and such. Good. 
Oh, just while I've got you, you want to jump off if you feel if you're yeah, up for it? Sad. I don't want to distract you too much from the job. From Monday, we were uh, last spoken. That, let me get up. <laughs> so last time we were here on Monday, we were down here, had a play on a digger, but you started off grading this bottom area, but this is all done now. Do you want to talk me through what you've done? We spoke about uh, doing the garden in different sections, different levels. Yep. So we've done the bottom level, then we did a cut, shaved the bottom level of the forebed then, which is where the cameraman's standing now, and then this is going to be the top level for the forebed. Going to see how the ground lays once we've built the wall to whether I'm going to take a little bit more off this because I'd like to keep it a little bit lower if I could okay. and then I'll probably use some of the Derbyshire stone to form a bit of a border. It's like a just gentle walk up. What I'm trying to avoid doing is putting too many steps in the garden. Makes sense. I'd like to have like a little bit of a ramp, okay? We're well, talking about a ramp. I can't believe you've got this in already. Cameraman yep. might want to backtrack so we can do the reveal. Do you want to talk through this and what was done here? By the way, I like the fact we're referring to him as cameraman now. It means he's replaceable. <laughs> Sorry, Harry. So yeah, the idea was that where the dividing line is between the two properties, I didn't want the access to be smack bang in the middle and take up too much of the garden. So I can see the end of that curve, if you draw a line straight through, that is end of the property, isn't it, for the four bed? Yeah. Perfect, so is the fence gonna run in line with that? Looking at, there's probably about um, 300 mil difference. Okay. The fence is gonna sit in to the left of it as we're looking at it. So there's gonna be a gravel strip down there, you see, between the two properties, so that's gonna help a bit of a soak away. Okay, so, as I said, coming out the back of the four bed with a nice featured door, straight up onto the ramp, not eating too much into the garden, then that gives you a lovely, great big space. And you can see the views we've got behind us. Stunning views. Gives you the best of that. We've spoken about the retaining wall, but this feels like the first bit of action to actually putting it into place. What are you doing here? So this is basically digging out for a footing. As you see, I've left this section in because there's no concrete blocks going in here. Okay. So don't need to do it. So the footing's done in two sections. We've got the lower section here, which isn't complete. It's gonna go round down towards the brook, and then kick round. This side, um, this is again, Low level wall up to say my waist height. Yep. As I'm sat here, stood here at the moment. And then it steps up. What's the requirement on depth when you're doing a footing like this? What are your considerations? It depends on ground condition. If you've hit really soft ground, then you obviously want to dig down and find something fairly firm before you start pouring footings. This has been quite nice for us, to be fair. Okay. Uh, and then also got to consider that it isn't for a house. So when you go out to uh, do an extension of the house, you'll often get build, building control come out. They'll come out, check the ground conditions, check your depths and give you the okay before you pour your foot in. Okay. So again, this is down to experience. This is just a basic retaining wall in the garden. So you don't have to go that far with it. It's a busy day. Chris, you've been busy. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed this. Do you want to just talk me through what this is, what's in the box, and have a quick tour of what you've done inside the downstairs WC where the boiler's going? So in the cottage, we've got the boiler going on here. Yep. And we've previously spoke about not having the flue coming out yep. into, the, into the garden, into the patio area. So we've opted for a vertical flue. So the flue is what comes off the top of a boiler, yep. either vertical or horizontal, and it gets rid of the gases which that boiler creates. Perfect. So you'll see throughout the year, mainly in winter, You'll see a lot of houses with, it looks like smoke pluming from a house. That's the flue pumping out the gases from the boiler. We originally had flue here. One there, yeah, flue from here. the old boiler. Old boiler, taking that out. Now we've gone for a vertical flue. Yes. So just explain to me how that works. So what, what we've well, got- And really what you've had to do to put that in. Temporarily, put it in to mark out where the flue's going internally and to give me an idea of where it's going. Make sure we're not hitting a joist, make sure we're not hitting anything structural under the tiles mm -hmm. in that bit of roof space. Uh, so we've got a weathering slate, which is a bit of lead with a plastic collar on, which doesn't allow water ingress back into the building. So what this will do, this will slot inside that black collar. We've got two layers of pipe here. The plastic one yep. is our exhaust gases out. So there's collars on there, there's seals on there, which will attach to the boiler. Our flue gases will go up that and out through the top. The outer one mm -hmm. is our clean air in. Okay. So for the boiler to work correctly, we need a certain amount of clean air for combustion. Um, so it draws clean air through this external collar back into the boiler, uses it, pushes it out. So if I just take that off your hands, can you just explain to H and everyone watching what you've done inside the downstairs WC? Because I can see you've been knocking out some bits of floor. The mess is for our new stop tap. So as you've seen, there's a new stop tap that we've put in. We've then got to find that internally. We've got to dig down 750 to run our blue main from inside or from outside to inside. So we can have an internal stop tap for customer and user use. 
Cold this this will be where the cold main is, even though we've only got a 25 mil pipe coming in. You we've just got, got carried away. I got carried away, man. I look <laughs> big hammer, you know. <laughs> so that's the stop tap inside the cottage that you're working on right now, but you've made some progress inside the house. So yeah, the finished, or more or less the finished product, we've connected externally to the stop new stop tap put in. So let's just let Nick through. Yeah, so, so Adam's uh, looking a lot better than me. <laughs> so here we have our new brass stop tap. So we've got our blue poly coming through from the external stop tap with a brass 25 by 22 stop tap um, for the end user. That'll come up around there somewhere. Don't turn it on, it will get wet. It'll come up and then it'll run 22 mil copper around here, upstairs, and around the rest of the property. That was going, you ready, H? Yeah. Oh. The door just fell off. It just broke our door. Look, this is what happens, by the way. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's actually cracked the door. I just tried to shut it to this get the This is an stuff. authentic £400 door, mate. It's not £400 anymore. No, it's not £400 no, 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 anymore. No, no, I'd say this is less. what Nick does when you pull him off a job yeah. and say, can we just piece the camera for five minutes? He's like, you're going to oh, pay for it? That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Nick, it's been a while since we got you on camera to speak through. And when I came through the property earlier this week, I saw a bunch of cables. Yes. So we run first fix involves chasing, pulling cables, that sort of stuff. So normally we'd put boxes in, but we wanted, because it's an older building and there's that much strange, interesting things with it, like pulling the floorboards up where the nails were, there's no tongue and groove, it's chipboard, it's double boarded, it's triple board. There's so many things like, we should be a lot further than we are, but there's so many things that are cropping up, which we're not used to, which is, it's nice to learn, nice from my apprentice to see. But one thing is this oak beam. So this is and what we would have nowadays as an RSJ. It should be hidden in the ceiling. But when these were put in solid oak, what you would normally get is all the cross joists, they just sit on top. Mm -hmm. Either full pieces or they're doubled over and they're sat within top. And we thought, running cables, we're bringing stuff across, we want to go to the fuse wall, which is over there. We were just going to pull it across, across and down. And then we took a floorboard up and we found, right, there's the, there's the art. This, actually sits nearly flush with the boards which is unusual normally there's a good bit of a gap and it's a five board span upstairs and then we looked at it and we thought we tried to do one drill bit through but we don't even my long drill bits aren't tough enough to go through a solid oak beam like this especially how old it is so we had to reroute by, by pulling up loads of boards you could see how they actually spent the time and effort with hand chisels and saws no power tools back in the day of how they all notch it together with all dovetail joints so i'll run you upstairs and you can have a look so this room is directly above the beam that we were just talking about oh here's the beam yeah okay right so what you have we tried to drill through i think we got one hole through there but if you were to see there see the three dashes so that was obviously number three, as you can tell, but the dovetail joints, so they're physically notched out and dovetailed each individual joist into it. So the craftsmanship of that oh, already, wow. to do it with hand tools, is absolutely so, incredible. As you said downstairs, normally they would be sitting on top of this. They would sit on top of it. straight across all the joints but, of Yeah, but the thickness, I haven't got tape measure, the thickness of this oak beam, realistically, we're talking, it's that. Because we thought it was maybe cut in half and it was in, this was an individual slot in, yep. but it's not. As we've gone along, you can see here, so these three dashes, my apprentice Adam was like, well, what's the three dashes for? And I said, it's so they would have marked out who's doing what, because it would make sense that they were slotted in, but they're one solid piece. And then if you go over here, you have a V dash three, which in Roman numerals is eight, and then you've got a nine. And he says, well, how old is the house? Because he's thinking it's Roman numerals, why is it that old? But it's back in the day, instead of writing one, two, three and having curved numbers, you would just do it with a chisel and you would just do lines. So everything would be done in Roman numerals. So, so real craftsmanship then? Uh, incredible. And how much effort it would have been with old saws that you would have to sharpen by hand, chisels, mallets. Nothing like this was done with a power tool. So, but the annoying thing with that is because we couldn't get through it, all the cables that came from here had to be rerouted up across and across. So that's what we've got here. So this is what it should look like compared to what it looked like. We've just cut them out where someone had notched the top of the joist in the past around all the cable surface, which takes the structure integrity out of the joist, taking notches, plumbers, take no, yeah. Um, so we drill center with the joist. What you would do is there's, there's a specific measurements you do with uh, cutting through joists, the span from the wall, the thickness of it, a way you should cut with a hole like we do here. Four, to me, is more than enough here. I wouldn't want to drill any more. I wouldn't want to go a bigger bit. I think these are 22 mil holes. Some people actually use 35, uh, 32 mil holes, which is okay if you're just drilling the one or maybe two, but I wouldn't want to do four 32 mil holes next to each other because it would just weaken the whole strength of it. And then obviously if you then start putting cables on the top, which is notched over there, anyone putting a new floorboard down, you're just susceptible to nails and screws going in it. 
So here we didn't have the, the choice because everything was cross nailed in and around each board. You can't, there's one there, look. It was sort of, it was really odd, really, really odd. But we had to go around with an angle grinder, physically angle grind floorboards up, which I've never done before. We're getting there, it's taking its time, but we've got the ring main into the kitchen, the cooker for the, six month for the cooker. We've got a radial circuit for downstairs, radial circuit for upstairs. We've got downstairs lighting in with all the two ways and we're just about to start the lights upstairs, which is fun. So before we let you get back to work with Adam, one thing I spoke to you about yesterday is sort of the knock-on effect of your work. So right now you've explained what the first fix is. Yes. What's the next stages? Once someone's getting a house rewire, first fix is done, what then happens? We can either do a bit of bond, we probably might stick a bit of bonding in ourselves, just the whole care was in place. Uh, we would then disappear off and do our own stuff for however long. Plaster should come in, skim, chippies come in, either sorting flooring out or whatever they're doing. Other trays will come in, but we will come in once it's almost a finished wall, either been plastered and it's dry, or it's been painted as well. We would then start putting our accessories on, sockets, switches, light fittings, down lights, uh, then it'll lead to fuse board going on, powering up, testing, and that's that's us done. That's for this job, it's a while away yet because there's so many thing, different things and cogs turn at the same time. But as of now, I think we're a couple of days away. I think we're one day away from this being first fixed, and then we've got to go and jump across the cottage, which would be a lot simpler because there's none of these floorboards over there. There's none of these oak beams just protruding to the floor, and it's a lot smaller as well. It's only two beds, so it shouldn't be too much, too much of an hassle. And from that, first fix is done. Nick will then be disappearing off site until, like you said, we've got the plastering in, we've got the lick paint coming in with Paint Warrior, and once all that's done, you come back on site and start fixing all the accessories. Yep. Yep. Perfect stuff. I'll let you get back to it. Cool. Cheers, dude. Dan, this has all changed since last time we had you on camera. Can you just talk through what we've done around the front of the property? When we took out the front, uh, we're finding it mishmash all over the place. And what I thought is, we'll keep the stonework because it's within keeping for the area. We'll reuse it and make a feature of it out the front. So what we've done is basically bed it down to a concrete bed, launch the back of it to give it some strength because obviously it's on a roadside, raise the levels a little bit, we're going to landscape the front, make it nice and simple, maybe a gravel finish with some potted plants. How are we getting into the property? Yeah, so this is going to be like a step up onto a platform that's going to ramp down yep. into the doorway. And what we're going to have near the house, obviously we're going to have gravel anyway, but we're going to make sure there's a deeper trench outside the front to get to the soak away as well, so you're never going to retain any moisture down here. Dan, before we talk about the retaining wall, have to give a shout out to our friends over at Tippers Builders Merchants. I've had a working history with them for a long time. Fantastic team to work with. Talk about this retaining wall, because this wasn't in place last time we were actually on site. Talk me through the process of what's gone on. What we've done is say, we've had the concrete pour. When we did the pour, we didn't just flood it in and leave it. We went back a couple of hours later, because the water starts to set on the top. Then we'll scrape the water off and just tamp it and use a laser level, which you've probably seen knocking about, and we'll just get it all set within a five mil because our bed's going to be 10 to 15 on the bottom course, so we know we're going to get over the top of any little lumps and bumps, then we can lay our first course of bricks. First part of setting out is always the most time consuming. As you can see, we've got our pins set out here. Got a laser level, set our marks on the pins, then we'll pull the lines out, and you're laying your blocks to that line, checking your levels as you're going along. Then you've also got the transition, where Harry, our cameraman, stood, where it steps down to. You've given courses. him a name today. I've given him a name today. You mean this bit down here? Yeah, this bit down here. Reason being, is you don't want to lose a lot of material in the ground. Okay. As you can see, you could probably use another two courses in the ground that you don't need to. You're never going to see it. So we dug it down, concreted. Sorry, for me, what you're talking about is you'd rather pour the concrete than have the bed the same level and end up having to use more of these. Yeah. I had to do a bit of working out to get the joints right, block sets right, levels right, and carry it all the way through. As you can see, running parallel to the house, so it wasn't just set out anyhow. We measured off the face of the house, the existing build, and set it a set measurement. The footing's a bit wider than what we normally do because we spoke about having a land drain system in, and that's going to be down the back of the block work here. So and that's got... going to act as a natural soak away for the moisture at the top of the garden, running down the property towards the brook. That's it, yeah. So it's going to run down here, and even though we've got a bit of a step out on the corner of the wall here, we can take it round the back of this block work because this ground's going to get made up. Yep. There's going to be a step here when we come down the patio of the porcelain. It'll run underneath and it'll go out to brook because it's all surface water. So end of the garden, retaining wall comes to the corner, you built that corner up. What's happening to kind of cap off the garden? It's the best way I can think about it. Yeah, so what we spoke about before, about making it uh, owner friendly. So if you imagine you've got small pets, small kids, we want to try and make sure that we're safe because obviously you've got a brook next to us. So the idea is we're going to come up four courses all the way across here. Mm -hmm. We're going to tie into this brick wall here, giving it all a bit more strength. Then we're going to put some, maybe some trellis across the top. Okay. So you can still see through but it's going to keep everyone safe. Chris, so you've been busy in the downstairs WC, mate? Yes, in the cottage. So we've got 
our chase here, which is going to run our heated part work and our hot and cold part work to upstairs, the kitchen, and the bathroom. Have you chased that out? Hard work. Hard work. Hard SDS work. drill. SDS grinder. Cut a few lines in it, and then chip out the rest. Makes sense. We've got the stop tap in finally, so that'll go somewhere close to that back wall. We've got to stub this back wall out to incorporate the concealed system from Rocker. So a lot of part work will be hidden in there. Um, so yeah, it'll all run from the boiler, down and around, magna clean and stuff under the bottom, um, and then up there into the rest of the house. So let's go, let's have a look at what's, what's this stuff going on? This around? is air felt. So what I've put in, it's, it's not mandatory, it's not necessary, but it just protects the plastic from rubbing as it expands and contracts against brickwork. And also just creates that little bit of insulation around it so you're not getting heat loss through your pipes in the walls under the floors as you're going from the border to the radiator. For anyone watching, what sort of pipe is this? Because you can run <coughs> systems in different pipes, can't you? We spoke yes. about in a previous episode. Yeah, yeah. That's, this, this is 10mm speed fit. Okay. So I'm going to do 10mm to all, it's kind of the tails to the radiators. Mm -hmm. um, so drop down the wall, come out, we're going to pop out in copper to the radiator valves, uh, but all on the floor will be 22mm heating circuit. So from the boiler, round will be 22 mil and then we'll just branch off in 10 mil why do you pop out into copper for the valves is it purely aesthetics yeah it, it just looks nicer it just looks tidier same in here same chases down off central heating um under there for central heating as, as i've said before we're going to put two smaller ads in rather than just one big one sat under a window mm -hmm. um and then upstairs we're looking at first fixing but we've got to check that chimney stack to make sure that can come out for the shower tray in the bathroom Who do you, you need to speak to dan for that yes <coughs> Half of it's there. Yeah. The other half is here. Now the shower tray is going to come out to there. Yes. And back to the wall. <clears throat> oh yeah. So initially, we've got to square this wall off because it's on the angle of the dangle. It wouldn't matter to us, but if you've got someone like Harry in here, standing in your shower, you bang your head. Not just that, the moisture, I suppose. If you're in the shower area, that'll get into the timber sooner or later and cause that damage, wouldn't it? You, so. you can tile it, but it'll look, it won't, it won't look the prettiest. Look dark. This whole bit was an existing chimney. So as it goes upstairs into the loft, that carries the stack on up above the roof. So this is existing chimney rest. It would have come down, downstairs, and then fed something, a, a fire or something, for the old mill. Um, so initial thoughts is we take it out above ceiling level. Yeah. Um, and just, just remove that. It doesn't go downstairs to anything. Okay. It's obviously an existing stack for the mill. Yes, so we're talking go up into the loft, lintel it, and then... Lintel across, bolt it to the wall. Because we'd have to tie into the external brickwork as well, wouldn't we? Because it's coming out away from the external wall. Yes. So have to tie it in the lintel one way. Yep. <clears throat> Double lintel over the two skins of bricks. Yeah. Come on across there, yeah. And then... We could take this out above the stairs if we wanted to, which ideally you would do because there's nothing. Yeah, if you're not going to cut it in half and leave it, are you? No. Um, luckily, it's not too much to take out because then it just disappears. But there's nothing on the outside of the wall, is there? No, it's just flat, isn't so it? So it literally comes down there to there and stops. So yeah, so we'll support it in the loft. Once that's supported, take all that out. You can then floor to the ceiling, tiling in the shower cubicle, and jobs are good then, aren't it? And these just have a look at the because it doesn't look like the walls are sound up there. Those what? Those look the same. So what we're planning on doing is taking this section out just above ceiling level and supporting it upstairs to allow for proper size tray within the shower enclosure. Feels like a big job to take all that out though, right? It is and it isn't. It's to make the finish of the bathroom look top notch. It's kind of needed to be taken out because we've got an ob shaped bathroom. Putting a shower tray here. You've constantly got a window here, so whether you frost the grass or what it frost the glass, you'll still have shadows of people walking past. So a bit more privacy, better arrangement in the bathroom, tuck it in that corner, but we've just got to make allowances taking that out. It's almost like that was the original chimney would have come all the way down, Chris. Because speaking to the previous owner, he did say that his father put the staircase in, so that would have come all the way down. So it looks like it's been modified before. Um, yeah, what we're going to do is do exactly the same. We'll take it into the roof space. So I'm, ge was... I'm guessing that's what that wooden lintel as such is. Yeah. Because that wouldn't have been there from an original chimney. So we could probably put in a steel with um, steel plate to support the stack. Yeah which is basically like the same sort of case, put a lintel in as usual, steel plating, 
amount of tie into the rest of the brickwork and that was yeah. important. There's not a lot of load up there if you look it up, is there? It's only like a meter. No, so. no, no. There's there's what's on the roofing up there, isn't there? Yeah. And there's not a lot of head space in there. So I think we'll probably look at to... That's only plasterboard as well, so that's not Yeah, stud work that, yeah. A massive issue patching these two walls up either. Yeah, so structural engineer, tells what the income we need in here, we'll get it installed. Yeah. Dan, can't shy away from this. <laughs> no, not at all. Been a little bit, half an hour trying to wait for the rain to pass a little bit. You've helped me with some measuring. How does this impact you doing groundworks on the outside of a job, specifically when you're quoting for work? Like, because as a customer, obviously I'm trying to get the job done, but I have to take consideration these sort of conditions. How does it impact you? Yeah, so if we start off with the strip out, so when we come to take muck away from a job, say we're taking soil content away, wagons base it on a weight limit. So if you imagine you're taking 20 tonne away, the ground's heavier when it's wet, which means you're taking less of a load. All of a sudden, that's more loads going away, your price is going up. Yep. Customers thinking, where's this come from? Last time you quoted me six months ago, it was cheaper, we didn't take as much muck away. Well, it was drier. Yep. So that, there's one reason that price can go up for your customer. The other is your ground conditions as well. So some ground conditions you might find feel firm underfoot when it's dry, but then also when it's wet, it'll feel softer. So you can't build off soft ground. You have to dig down further, remove more spoil, and build it back up again with aggregate. And in terms of like this retaining wall, which is like the key piece of work you're doing at the moment, yeah. can you even lay blocks in this weather? No, you, you struggle. I mean, you can see, as we have this morning, we put a few blocks down. It was nice and dry. Nice wet mix is fantastic. I've got a mix sat in that uh, wheelbarrow at the moment. If I try to lay that, yes, I'll probably get the blocks to sit, but the water will get in and they'll probably start to sink a little bit because your mix doesn't want to be too firm when laying. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to make it pliable so you can move your blocks without suit. Well, obviously with the actual moisture content, it just ruins the job and 100%. make it hard work. I just think it's a really important note, especially if you're a homeowner getting any work done. And you think about the price that a grounds work company or a landscaper needs to charge, they have to factor in all these external conditions because Dan might be trying to lay porcelain in two weeks time. We've got porcelain, 160 square meters of porcelain going down. Yeah. You can't lay it in this. No. But if he's put a fixed price job in on the job, all of a sudden he's out of work for that day. It's those sort of considerations that trades professionals have to factor into their quote that you often don't see as a homeowner. It can be pretty challenging. It can be, but also it also has an effect on your program. You might have jobs booked in for two or three weeks after the job, but you've been held up by the weather because you can't attend site. Loss of earnings. You're not earning that day. It's a massive knock-on.